One of the basic elements that make up the structure of sentences is a noun. There are different types of nouns, but they all have the same general function. Today, we're going to discuss different types of nouns as well as pronouns. We'll also talk about what they do and how to use them properly. Nouns are words that name a person, place, or thing. For example, dad, son, jet fighter, influenza, chalk, Halstead Street, and puppy are all nouns. This may seem broad, but nouns can be broken down even further into different categories depending on what the noun is doing in the sentence. Common nouns, like most of the words mentioned earlier, are words that refer to general things. These things do not have a specific name, like John or Eiffel Tower. Those would be proper nouns. We'll discuss those later. Here's an example of common nouns used in a sentence. Dinner was ready at 6 p.m. The common noun used in this example is dinner. Dinner in this case is a thing. Let's look at one more. The eggs were scrambled in the hot pan. This sentence has two common nouns, eggs and pan because they are both things or objects in the sentence. Seems simple enough, right? Proper nouns are people, places, or things that have specific names or titles. For example, dad is a common noun, but your dad's name might be Drew. Drew is a proper noun. A Chevy is the name for a brand of car, so it's also a proper noun. In addition, proper nouns are always capitalized. Let's see proper nouns in a sentence. Aunt Jackie is my favorite aunt on my mom's side. Aunt Jackie is someone's formal name, therefore it is a proper noun. Mom in this sentence is not someone's formal name, therefore it is just a common noun. Let's look at one more example. James proposed to Jesse near the Eiffel Tower in France. This example is full of proper nouns. James and Jesse are the given names of people while the Eiffel Tower is the proper name of an object and France is the official name of a country, a place. Collective nouns are nouns that refer to a collective group or multiple number of something. A class of students, a flock of birds, a team of players, a crowd of fans. Nouns can also come in plural and singular forms. Just as it sounds, some nouns describe a single object, person, or idea that stands alone, or multiple objects, people, and ideas. Let's look at an example and see if we can identify the singular nouns in the sentence. The dog fell asleep on the porch with its toy nearby. Here, we see a few singular nouns. There's only one dog, one porch, and one toy mentioned. Therefore, we know these are the singular nouns in this sentence. Identifying plural nouns can be just as simple. Most nouns can be made plural by adding an S or ES at the end of the word. Here, we'll look at an example using our previous example and see if we can spot the plural nouns. The dogs fell asleep on the porch with their toys nearby. In this sentence, we made a few changes. We see now an S was added to dog and toy. By adding an S, these once singular nouns are now plural. Now the sentence is describing multiple dogs and toys on one porch. Here's one more example. The businesses had a huge increase in savings this year. In this sentence, we can see that businesses is the plural noun because it is describing more than one business. We made the word plural by adding an ES on the end. Remember, when making a singular noun plural, if the noun ends in CH, sh, x, z, s, or sometimes o, we add es to the end of it. There are other rules to properly make singular nouns plural. For example, nouns that end in y must have the y taken out and replaced with ies. There are always some exceptions to these rules, but the way you make a singular noun plural depends on what letter the word ends with. As you learn more words, these rules and exceptions will become easier to remember. Possessive nouns are nouns that describe ownership of something. We show ownership by adding apostrophe s to the end of a noun or an apostrophe to the end of a word that ends with s. One way to determine which noun is the possessive noun is to identify the object and ask to whom or what does this belong to. No worries if this rule seems confusing. Here are a few examples to practice. 
Liz scratched mom's car while driving. In this sentence, we see three nouns, but only one of them is possessive. Mom's would be the possessive noun because the aforementioned car belongs to her, not Liz. Nouns that don't refer to humans or animals can also be possessive. Here's another. Can you spot the possessive noun in this sentence? The bus's doors were jammed and the students couldn't board. In this example, the possessive noun is buses because the doors mentioned belong to the bus. Did you notice the placement of the apostrophe? Here, not only does buses end with an S, but buses is also plural. Remember, nouns that end with an S, like bus or boss, are made plural by adding an ES at the end. When trying to make nouns that end with an S possessive, you must first determine if the noun is singular or plural to know where to put the apostrophe. To make a singular noun possessive, we simply add apostrophe S to the end of it, even if the noun already ends in S, because we want to show that there is only one of this thing or person possessing something. When dealing with plural nouns that end in ES, we make the noun possessive by adding the apostrophe at the end of the word. Pronouns are words that take the place of nouns. To keep from sounding repetitive, pronouns can describe a person, place, or thing without naming it multiple times in the same sentence or paragraph. Pronouns also come in many forms. Today, we'll only talk about personal pronouns and a few others as well as nominative, objective, and possessive cases. Like other nouns, pronouns can also be singular, plural, and possessive, and represent a person or thing. Here's an example of a sentence with no pronouns. Jasmine loves movies. Jasmine goes to the theater often and has Jasmine's own members pass. These sentences sound strange. Most people don't repeat someone's name over and over like that. That's why pronouns help eliminate the redundancy. Take another look at these sentences with pronouns used instead. Jasmine loves movies. She goes to the theater often and has her own members pass. This example looks and sounds a lot better. Here, we replace Jasmine with the pronouns she and her. As mentioned earlier, pronouns can also be possessive. We see that in the previous example, Jasmine owns a member's pass. So instead of saying Jasmine's pass, we use the possessive pronoun her to describe her possession of the member's pass. Other possessive pronouns include singular, his, her, mine. Plural possessive pronouns include theirs, ours, and yours. When talking about pronouns, it's also important to mention nominative and objective case. Nominative case refers to a noun that is performing an action or verb. In contrast, objective case is a noun that is having an action or verb taken upon it. Here's an example. Mariah drank water. Here, Mariah is in the nominative case because she is performing an action on the water the verb drink. Let's look at an objective pronoun example. Mariah caught the ball. Here, the ball is the objective pronoun because it was the object that had an action performed on it, which was it being caught. Indefinite pronouns represent a person or thing that we don't have a specific number of. For example, anybody can learn another language. In this case, the indefinite pronoun is anybody because it refers to an immeasurable amount of people. These pronouns are used to ask a question. What is her name? Whose keys are those? Intensive pronouns are pronouns that emphasize the pronouns that immediately precede it. She herself made sure to set the alarm. In this case, herself is meant to emphasize she, making herself the intensive pronoun. I myself made time to work out before bed. Here, myself refers to the pronoun I, making myself the intensive pronoun. Reciprocal pronouns are words that express an action is happening to two or more people or things at the same time. Reciprocal pronouns include each other and one another. The students switch tests with one another. We exchanged vows with each other. Demonstrative pronouns are pronouns that point to specific things. Examples of demonstrative pronouns are this, that, these, and those. Nouns and pronouns are essential pieces needed to complete sentences. Before we end, let's do a few practice examples to make sure we got the hang of all we went over today. What kind of noun is Tuesday? 
A, a common noun, B, possessive noun, C, proper noun, or D, none of the above? The answer is C, proper noun, because it's the name of a specific day. Which of the following singular nouns was made plural incorrectly? A, singer to singers, B, dish to dishes, C, church to churches, or D, tax to taxes. D, because nouns that end in X take an ES to make them plural. The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. This silly sentence contains all of the letters of the alphabet, and you might notice it also is stuffed full of adjectives. In this video, we'll talk about what adjectives are and how to use them in a sentence. An adjective is a word that describes a noun. It describes something's size, color, age, origin, material, or shape. Adjectives can be used to make the subject simpler to understand and to shed light on what an author wants their ideas to truly convey. The adjectives used in the sentence about the fox and the dog are quick and brown, describing the fox, and lazy, which describes the dog. Here's another example. She is the smartest student in the class. Student is the noun, and smartest is describing what kind of student she is. So smartest is the adjective. Shakespeare has been credited for adding hundreds of new words to the English language when he was writing, and many of those were adjectives. Some examples of Shakespearean adjectives are, Thou cold-blooded slave, hast thou not spoke like thunder on my side, been sworn my soldier, bidding me depend upon thy stars, thy fortune and thy strength, and dost thou now fall over to my fours? Cold-blooded is an adjective that describes the slave. It helps us to know what type of person the slave was. Cold-blooded is a word that had been used to describe snakes and reptiles, but Shakespeare used it for the first time to describe a person. Here's an example from the book Little Women. She remembered her mother's promise and slipping her hand under her pillow, drew out a little crimson covered book. Crimson covered describes the color of fabric that was covering the book. As you can see, using adjectives can make your sentences and ideas come to life. Instead of just saying that the firework display was beautiful, you can make it much more exciting and easier to envision what the fireworks actually looked like by saying, the fireworks this year were bursting brightly overhead as the bright, dazzling sparkles lit up the sky. Bright and dazzling are just two of the many, many adjectives that make writing so descriptive and fun to read. Describing situations in detail helps readers more vividly understand what is taking place. When describing things in more detail, adverbs are a helpful addition to make your sentences more colorful and portray the event clearly. In this video, we'll take a look at what adverbs do, how to identify them, and how to best use them in our writing. Let's get started. The easiest way to find an adverb in a sentence is to ask these questions. Where was something done? When was it done? How was it done? And to what extent was it done? An adverb will always answer one of those questions. For example, the adverb here answers the question, where? And the adverb randomly answers the question, how? An easy identifier for adverbs is the suffix ly. Not all adverbs use it, but the majority of adverbs do. Let's identify some adverbs by using our four questions. She went outside and walked the dog. Do any of those words in the sentence answer the question where, when, how, or to what extent? In this example, we see that outside is the adverb because it tells us where she went. Let's look at another. They briskly jogged through the park. Here, we see that the word briskly answers the question how something was done, making it the adverb in the sentence. Let's try one more example. She almost tripped while jogging, but regained her balance. This one might be tricky. In this example, we see that almost describes the extent to which something happens, which in this case was tripped. She almost tripped, making almost the adverb here. 
Adverbs not only modify verbs, they are also used to describe comparisons of two things. Adverbs have three degrees of comparison, positive, comparative, and superlative. The best way to explain positive, comparative, and superlative adverbs is to think of them as well, better, and best. When we want to describe the quality of something, we can say the thing itself is done well. That would be a positive adverb. We may compare that thing to something else and say, this thing is better than something else, which is known as a comparative adverb. Or we may simply say, this thing is the best, which is superlative. As you can see, with each comparison, the degree of its descriptor is increased. There are many ways of changing adverbs from positive to comparative and superlative. Let's go over each one with real examples and see how they differ. What's important to note about positive adverbs is that the words used don't necessarily have to be positive or good words. For example, the word badly is a positive adverb because it is the first or basic degree you can use to describe something without comparing it to anything else. Many adverbs can be modified to show different degrees by simply adding ER or EST to the end of the word. Adding ER to a word makes it comparative, meaning it's not the most of something, but it is more than something else. Adding EST to the end of a word means that the word it is describing is the most of something and nothing can be compared as being better than it. Here's an example. He ran through the field faster than his sister. In this example, the adverb faster responds to the question of how something was done. We also know this is a comparative adverb because of the added ER to the end of fast. This lets us know that this person ran at a higher speed compared to his sister. Here's another example. She was the quickest of everyone who ran the 5K. Here we see the adverb quickest answers the question of how something was done. Because there is an EST at the end of quick, we know that this adverb is superlative because no one else ran more quickly than this person. Some adverbs, especially those that end in LY, can't have their degrees increased to comparative or superlative forms by simply adding ER or EST to the end. These adverbs must have more and most preceding the word to be modified. Let's look at a few examples. The crowd cheered for her more joyfully than for the other performers. Here we can see that joyfully is the adverb because it answers the question of how the crowd cheered. We can also see that joyfully is a comparative adverb because of the word more before it. With this, we know that the crowd cheered more, but not the most joyfully. He completed his task most efficiently of all the employees. Again, in this example, the adverb efficiently is easy to spot not only because it ends in ly, but because it answers the question of how the task was performed. We also find the word most proceeding efficiently, which means this is a superlative adverb and no task was completed more efficiently than his. Some adverbs can't be made comparative and superlative with the use of er, est, more, or most. For irregular adverbs, changing their degree of comparison means changing the word and its spelling entirely. There is no special trick to these irregular adverbs, so they must be memorized over time to understand their implied degree of comparison. The word badly is an example of an irregular adverb. To make it comparative, you wouldn't say more badly or badlier. The comparative form of badly is worse, and the superlative form is worst. Other examples of irregular adverbs include little, which becomes less and least, and good, which becomes better and best. Now, let's look at adverbial phrases. Adverbial phrases perform the same function as adverbs and describe when, how, to what extent, and where something happens. What makes them different from normal adverbs is they are phrases, which means they are a group of two or more words and they don't always contain a typical ly adverb in the phrase. Here are some examples that answer the question, when. He goes camping every summer. They are going to sleep earlier than usual. Here, these highlighted phrases signify a time in which something occurs. In this sentence, he was driving haphazardly and recklessly. This adverbial phrase is made up of two adverbs and a conjunction to make a phrase that describes how something occurred. An adverbial clause is similar to an adverbial phrase. However, adverbial clauses, just like the name suggests, are clauses, which means they contain a subject, verb, and subordinating conjunction. 
Let's look at some examples. Sit at the table until your food is eaten. In this example, the adverbial clause, until your food is eaten, describes when something occurs. We also know it is a clause because it has a subject, food, and verb, eaten, as well as a subordinating conjunction, until. My sister, although she was hungry, wouldn't eat until I arrived. Here, the adverbial clause starts with a subordinating conjunction, although, has a subject, she, and a verb, is. Together, they describe the extent to which the sister wouldn't eat. Make sure you are polite to people wherever you go. This example shows the subordinating conjunction wherever, the subject you, and verb go to show when something happened. Before we go, let's do a little practice to refresh what we've learned. Number one, which of the following are not adverbs? A, entirely, B, rather, C, them, or D, cautiously. The answer is C, them. The word them is a pronoun. Number two, the highlighted word is an example of what? Some people agree that Serena Williams is the greatest athlete of all time. A, adverbial phrase, B, subordinating conjunction, C, comparative adverb, or D, superlative adverb. The answer is D, superlative. Prepositions are words that specify how something is related to something else in time and space. They work in a sentence to connect nouns or pronouns with other words and elements. Let's start with this example. The dog swam in the lake. There are two nouns in this sentence, dog and lake. We know from the verb swam what the dog is doing, but we need the preposition in to tell us where the swimming is happening. The dog is swimming in something, and that something is the lake. The second noun connected with the preposition, in this case the word lake, is called the object of the preposition and together with the preposition forms a prepositional phrase. There is no subject in the phrase in the lake, only a noun. Because of the preposition in, we know it's a prepositional phrase. This is an article, not a noun, so we know it can't be the object of the preposition. Lake, the noun we are trying to connect with our first noun, dog, is the object of the preposition. Most of the time though, not always, the object of the preposition comes after the preposition in the prepositional phrase. When we're trying to find the prepositional phrase in a sentence, first try to spot the preposition. Prepositions show direction, location, or time. Many of the most common prepositions are small words you use every day. At, by, for, from, in, of, on, to, and with are all prepositions. Think about this sentence and try to pick out the prepositional phrase. After work, Joe drove to the store in his car. There are three prepositional phrases in this sentence. Let's start with a simple one. Joe, the proper noun, is connected to the noun store by the preposition to. It answers a directional question. Where did Joe go? He went to the store. The word store is the object of the prepositional phrase to the store. Let's look for another preposition in this sentence. You might have noticed our preposition in appeared again in this sentence. In isn't a directional preposition like to, but it tells us where Joe was during his drive. He was in his car. Car is the object of the preposition in, and in his car is the prepositional phrase. Now, let's look back to the first word in the sentence, after. This is also a preposition. Remember, prepositions show direction, location, or time. After dinner is a prepositional phrase that tells us when Joe went to the store. Dinner is the object of the preposition. Not all prepositional phrases are quite so simple. Think of it like a sandwich. You have to have bread and filling to make a sandwich, right? A sandwich can be as simple as cheese between two slices of bread, but it can also have meat, veggies, and spreads. We can jazz up prepositional phrases the same way with adjectives and adverbs. As long as you still have the bread and the filling, preposition and object of the preposition, you'll still have a prepositional phrase.
Take this sentence, for example. The swallows flew over the trees near the lake. Over the trees in near the lake are the two prepositional phrases in this sentence. Over is a preposition that tells us the direction the swallows flew, and near is a preposition that tells us where the trees were located. These prepositional phrases are fairly simple, but look what happens if we make the sandwich more interesting. The swallows flew over the dark trees near the town's renowned lake. We still have the same two prepositions and prepositional phrases, but the words dark, towns, and renowned are all adjectives. Dark is modifying or adding meaning to the object, trees, of the first prepositional phrase, but it is otherwise not changing the preposition in any way. The same is true of towns and renowned. They are modifying the object of the preposition lake, and the second phrase, near, is still the preposition, and lake is still the object of the preposition. So let's recap. A preposition is a word that answers the question when or where something happened in a sentence. It connects nouns or pronouns to other nouns in the sentence. About, to, with, up, down, under, inside, after, before, and for are a few examples of common prepositions. The object of the preposition is the noun that the preposition is talking about, and together with the preposition, those objects make prepositional phrases. Hello and welcome. Today we're talking about subjects. Now, the subject of a sentence is the person, place, or thing, or idea that is doing or being. The subject is sometimes called the naming part of a sentence or clause. It shows what the sentence is about, or who or what is performing an action in the sentence. The subject is most often a noun, pronoun, or noun phrase. Now, it's easier to find the subject of a sentence if you first find the verb. Remember, a verb is any word used to describe an action, a state, or an occurrence. Ask yourself, who or what verbed in this sentence? The answer to that question is the subject. Let's try it with this sentence. Rachel ate her breakfast. The verb in this sentence is the word ate. It describes an action that Rachel took. So let's ask our question, who or what ate? Rachel did. Rachel is the subject of this sentence. A simple subject is the subject of a sentence without all of its modifiers. Modifying words help tell us more about the nouns and verbs, and sometimes even adverbs in a sentence. But they can make it difficult to find the subject. If you pull these away, you find your simple subject. Let's look at an example. The main reason, after all was said and done, wasn't enough to keep her there. There are quite a few things going on in this sentence, but if we strip away the modifying phrase, after all was said and done, we see the following sentence. The main reason wasn't enough to keep her there. Now, you may be tempted to assume the subject is her, since sometimes people are subjects, but let's ask our question, what wasn't enough? Not her, but the main reason. Reason here is the simple subject. Sometimes a simple subject can be a phrase rather than a single word. That's when things get a little more complicated. Take this sentence, for example. What he didn't know about life in the city could fill whole volumes. What he didn't know about life in the city is the simple subject. You can't strip it down any more than that. What could fill whole volumes? What he didn't know, life in the city, and he are all incomplete explanations. They must be taken together as a complete phrase. Now that we have a good grasp on simple subjects, let's talk about compound subjects. Take the following sentence. Jack and Jill went up the hill. Who went up the hill? Jack? Well, yes, that's not all though. Jill did as well. They are both subjects of the sentence. A compound subject is when two or more nouns are joined together to act as a subject. Think about this sentence. Rain, snow, and ice made driving impossible. Rain, snow, and ice are all three compound subjects of the sentence. Now let's have a little fun. What do you think is the subject of the following sentence? Come here now. Is it come? Is it here? Is it now? Is it non-existent? No on all accounts. If grammar wasn't confusing enough, now I'm asking you to evaluate invisible words. But don't worry, we can find the subject by asking our question. Who or what needs to come here now? The answer is you. If a mother is calling her son, she could say, you, come here now. If you're calling your friend, you could say, you, come here now. This is called an understood subject. 
often the subject of a command, order, or suggestion, you, is left out of the sentence. Strong and well-placed subjects make for strong writing. Avoid beginning sentences with the word there. It's a filler for other words in the sentence that are the true subjects. Look here. There are my shoes on the floor. In this sentence, there looks like the subject, but in reality, the word shoes already fills that role. There only adds words and makes the meaning less clear. We can clean the sentence up this way. Shoes are on my floor. Avoid mixing up the order of your subjects in verb phrase in the sentence. Take a look at this example. The plumber is Ben. This sentence would mean the same thing if you said, Ben is the plumber. But as it is, the subject is inverted and confusing. In general, it's best to write with a clear subject followed by the verb phrase that describes what the subject is doing. And don't forget, if you're having trouble finding the subject in a sentence, just find the verb and find out who or what is connected with that verb. Words are divided into different categories depending on their use and function. These categories are what we like to call the parts of speech. There are eight parts of speech in the English language. Nouns, pronouns, verbs, adverbs, adjectives, conjunctions, prepositions, and interjections. Today, we'll actually be talking about gerunds, participles, and infinitives. Now, you're probably wondering how those are related to the parts of speech, right? Well, for the sake of understanding these concepts, just think of those three as various ways in which the different parts of speech can be used. In other words, the main parts of speech are your tools, and our three topics for today are the projects you need the tools for. A gerund is a word that is created with a verb but functions as a noun always ending in ing. Being used as a noun, a gerund can function as a subject, a subject complement, a direct object, an indirect object, or an object of a preposition. It's important to note that though gerunds may look a lot like present participles, they are not the same thing. Gerunds are specifically placed in the noun position of a sentence, whereas present participles are placed with a verb phrase, usually as modifiers. Here is an example of a gerund in the subject position. Brushing your hair prevents it from tangling. In this sentence, the word brushing is the gerund functioning as the subject of the sentence. If a gerund were to be the complement of a subject in a sentence, it would look like this. Her number one priority is working. Working is functioning as a complement to the subject priority. Here's an example where the gerund is the object of a preposition. There is no use in standing in the line for three hours, grandma said. In this sentence, standing follows the preposition in, making it the object of the preposition. Gerunds can also function as the object of a sentence. Very similar to gerunds are participles. Participles are words created from verbs that are then used as adjectives to modify nouns in a sentence. They can also be used as introductions to adverbial phrases. There are present and past participles. Present participles always end in ing and correlate to events taking place in the current tense. The past participle can be either regular or irregular and refers to events that have already happened. Differentiating between participles and gerunds can be a little tricky sometimes because participles can actually function as gerunds. For our purposes today, we're gonna to take a look at some rather straightforward examples. When using a participle as an adjective, you might come across a sentence like this. The browning fruit should be put outside for composting. Browning is a present participle, noted by the ing ending, that is modifying the noun fruit. I spent the whole day studying math. In this sentence, studying is a present participle that is working as the beginning of an adverbial phrase in the sentence. The phrase studying math is modifying the verb spent. How did I spend the whole day studying math? Both of those examples were present participles, meaning the words ended in ing to denote something happening in the current time. As mentioned, there are such things as past participles. Past participles can have varied word endings depending on the word being used. 
Most commonly, you will see D or ED added to the end of a word. Let's look at a couple of examples. The windows were cracked when the rainstorm came through. Here, the word cracked is the past participle working as an adjective to modify the noun windows. He continued forward, cautioned by the desolate streets. Cautioned is the past participle in this sentence, functioning as the beginning of an adverbial phrase describing the word continued. Additionally, participles can also appear as multi-part verbs. The multi comes from attaching an auxiliary verb or helping verb to the main verb being used in the sentence. Joanne was baking fresh cookies for her grandkids. In this sentence, only one helping verb is used, was. It is paired with the participle baking to create a multi-part verb. Joanne has been baking all morning. The helping verb in the sentence has been participle baking. Joanne would have been reading all morning if her grandkids hadn't said they were coming over. Helping verb would have been participle reading. Knowing how to form different endings of the participles allows for a variety of meanings to be conveyed. Unlike gerunds and participles, infinitives do not change their endings. They are always in the simple singular form. Infinitives are singular verbs usually preceded by the word to. They do not have any specific suffixes, they're just simple in nature. In other words, the verbs are unconjugated. Infinitives can be used as a noun, an adjective, or an adverb. Most likely, when you're dealing with infinitives, you'll be dealing with the present infinitive. That's what we'll be looking at today. The to is used with the infinitive to show the purpose of something or maybe to express someone's opinion. Let's take a look at some examples of infinitives. Noun, Josh wants to study as soon as he gets home from school. Adjective, today she wants to show Josh a new game to play. Adverb, Josh played the new game with his sister instead of studying to make her happy. We've discussed quite a bit today Remember, gerunds are words that are formed from verbs and used as nouns, always ending in ing. Participles are words created from verbs that can be used as adjectives or an adverbial phrase, also ending in ing, unless expressing past tense. And infinitives are verbs that take the simple tense and follow the preposition to. Whether it's a simple tale, like The Three Little Pigs, or a long-winded play like The Tragedy of Hamlet, a well-told story will always have a defined plot. A plot is the sequence of main events in a story. These events generally take place in a specific order, which gives the story a specific structure. This structure can be divided into five basic elements, exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, and the resolution. Let's take a look at each of these. The exposition, or beginning, of a plot sets the scene. It is the part of a story where the writer builds the world, sets the time frame, and introduces characters to help the reader understand when and where things are taking place. The rising action of a plot is where the story begins to develop. Conflicts are introduced that complicate the lives of the character and create suspense. These tensions can be a cause of excitement or crisis as the characters deal with the conflict put in front of them. The climax of a plot is when the tensions or actions have reached their peak and characters have reached a turning point in the story. From this point on, the reader is left to wonder what will happen next and if the tensions will be resolved. The falling action of a plot occurs once the conflict from the onset of the story begins to resolve itself. Finally, the resolution of a plot is the last element to take place. The resolution is the conclusion of the story, which can be happy, tragic, or open for interpretation. Regardless, a well-written conclusion will make it clear that the story has come to an end. These are elements that storytellers have used for centuries. Back in 335 BC, Greek philosopher Aristotle wrote a book called Poetics, which talked about his theories about drama and storytelling. According to Aristotle, plots played a major role in the structure of poetry and tragedies during his time. In fact, to him, the plot, or mythos, was the most important element in a tragedy. He claims the plot should move from beginning to middle, then to the end in an organized sequence where the beginning doesn't pick up from any previous event, and the end ties up all loose threads within the story. Aristotle also believed there were two types of plots, simple and complex. Simple plots are a unified construct of probable actions with a change in fortune. 
This can be seen clearly in most cliche horror movie plots. Friends go on a road trip, car runs out of gas, friends find old house when searching for help, friends explore old house, someone gets attacked, friends fight for survival, someone gets away. There is a chain of cause and effect events in this simple plot that move the story forward. However, a complex plot will have what's known as a reversal of fortune or a recognition in the story. A reversal of fortune is a pivotal point of the story where the protagonist experiences a change from being secure to being vulnerable. Recognition is a moment of insight where the protagonist understands their place in the larger story. An example of this can be seen in the character Macbeth from the play of the same name by William Shakespeare. Macbeth went from a content and quiet aristocrat to an overly ambitious and tyrannical king. This tyranny arose from the belief that, according to a prophecy, no one born of a woman could defeat him. This was a reversal in the plot. Because he took the prophecy literally, he felt invincible. That is, until Macduff, who Shakespeare describes as being born via C-section, appears here. It's here Macbeth realizes the prophecy did not make him invincible, and he is defeated by Macduff. This is an example of recognition for both Macbeth and Macduff, who realize their places within the story as the conflict between them is resolved. Okay, now that we've learned what plots are, let's look at a quick review question to test your memory. Which of the following are the correct elements of a plot and are in the correct order? A. Climax, falling action, exposition, rising action, resolution. B. Exposition, rising action, climax, falling action, resolution. C. Exposition, elevation, climax, falling action, and the end. Or D. Exposition, rising action, highlight, falling action, and the resolution. The correct answer is B. Whether you are reading a post on social media, an article in a magazine, or a novel in class, whoever wrote the piece that you're reading probably has their own opinion about the subject. We all have opinions, and these opinions not only spill into the words we speak, but also seep into the words we write. That's why it's important for readers to be able to identify when bias is being revealed in what is read. Doing so can help you as the reader to separate fact from opinion and be accurately informed on whatever topic you are researching. Today, we'll look into this further by identifying language that shows bias, discussing the importance of omission, and why identifying the author's position is important for effective reading. Let's get started. Adjectives that an author uses can be a clear way of figuring out their stance on a subject. For example, when recalling a series of events, such as the final score of a basketball game, someone may write, the blue team beat the red team by seven points. This is an unbiased statement. The author tells us objectively who is playing and what happened with no opinions to be seen. In contrast, what if the author reported the same game in this way? My favorite team, the red team, lost to the cheating blue team. It's pretty obvious in this sentence that the author favors the red team over the blue team. This sentence is riddled with bias because the author blatantly states their opinion about the two teams. The author also says that the blue team cheated. Now that we know that the author likes the red team more, can we believe his account that the blue team actually cheated as a fact? Has the author made himself credible? No way. Now, what if the author wrote an account of the same game this way? The blue team, unfortunately, beat the red team by seven points. In this sentence, just by adding the word unfortunately, there seems to be some bias on the author's part. Language that conveys emotion is another means that authors use to show their position. He seems to be upset that the blue team won and not the red team. Even subtle words like this can give away an author's opinion on a subject, so it's important to take the weight of each word thoroughly when reading. Here's one more example. The red team had their victory stolen from them by the blue team. Again, language is very important when identifying the author's position. Instead of saying the red team lost, he chose to describe the outcome of the game as a stolen victory. That's very strong language and hints to the author's bias towards the red team since he compared their loss as being the victim of a crime. Omitting information from a piece of writing can also be a form of bias. 
By leaving out information, an author can inform the reader on only what he wants us to know and therefore sway our opinion on the subject. Let's look at a few examples. Nicole is notorious for being late to work. In this sentence, the reader is left to assume why Nicole is always late. Could she be a bad worker? Is she bad at time management? All we know is that she is often late and the word notorious emphasizes how this is not a positive trait for her to have. The sentence doesn't shine a positive light on Nicole. What if the author were omitting some information? Let's look at a similar sentence. Nicole is notorious for being late to work because she doesn't have a car and lives far away. Now that we know Nicole's circumstances, she doesn't sound like such a bad worker, does she? The fact that she lives far away and doesn't own a car even makes her sound like she works very hard to get to work, although she's often late. If the author didn't share this information, we likely wouldn't have come to this conclusion. Reading critically and finding missing pieces in an author's narrative is an important way of identifying the author's position. Facts and opinions can sometimes seem very similar. That is why readers must consider the writer's personal feelings when they wrote the piece and qualify what is credible and what should be questioned. We do this by identifying emotional language, keeping track of opinion statements, and identifying information that is omitted or not clearly stated. Doing these things can lead to meaningful discussions on the subject, but also filter the relevance of the information we take and to make our comprehension of the subject clearer. Here is a short exercise to practice what we've gone through today. Which sentence doesn't show the author's position? 1. Yellow flowers are my favorite. 2. Yellow flowers are better than purple ones. 3. There were purple and yellow flowers on the lawn. 4. There were homely purple flowers next to the yellow ones. The answer is number 3. Since this sentence contains no adjectives and doesn't state anything other than the basic facts on the situation. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. Shakespeare's words have a ring of truth, even though they might not be literally true. Metaphors like this one help bring ideas to life. But what is a metaphor? Metaphors are a type of figurative language. Figurative language uses figures of speech to make written and verbal communication more effective, easier to understand, and more striking. Metaphors are a specific type of figurative language called imagery. There are seven types of imagery in figurative language. Similes, metaphors, and allusions use non-literal comparisons that illuminate ideas. Personification uses a non-literal comparison exclusively to a person, as in the leaf danced across the lawn. Alliteration, assonance, and automatopoeia use sounds to create different feelings in the audience than the literal words would normally convey. Getting back to our specific topic, metaphors are words or phrases that compare two things. Unlike a simile, they do not use the words like or as to compare the words. Instead, they state that one thing is another thing. Like in the quote from Shakespeare, the world is a stage. Metaphors are used in literature, movies, plays, and even in day-to-day -day speech. You might even find yourself using metaphors without realizing it. Some commonly used metaphors include, love is a battlefield, there's a blanket of clouds, time is a thief, he's a night owl. All these examples compare two things directly. Love is compared to a battle, clouds are compared to blankets, time is compared to a thief, and man is compared to an owl. Of course, we know that a man is not literally an owl, but the comparison helps us to visualize things in a much more vibrant way. How boring would it be to say he likes to stay up late at night on a consistent basis? Other types of metaphors use indirect comparisons. A couple of examples include work has dried up. Their ideas are difficult to swallow. In these metaphors, you have two steps in the comparison. In the first example, work is not being compared to dried up, but rather to something that can be dried up. 
You can use your imagination to fill in the comparison. Maybe an empty swimming pool or a dry desert oasis. Similarly, ideas are not being swallowed. Ideas are being compared to something that you eat that is hard to swallow. Maybe a dry cracker or a peanut butter sandwich. This type of indirect comparison allows someone to fill in an image with personal experiences. Maybe you've never been to a desert, but you have gone through a hot, dry summer. Maybe you've never eaten a peanut butter sandwich, but you have had to swallow a big pill. Making images personal helps draw you into the story and makes it that much more visceral. Here are some examples of metaphors outside of everyday speech. In the poem, The Tiger by William Blake, he expounds on the beauty and danger of the wild tiger. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? The first line of the poem says the tiger is burning bright. Of course, the tiger is not literally on fire, but this comparison is used as a metaphor to illustrate the tiger's bright color and even the tiger's dangerous nature. Like getting burned by a fire, the tiger can be a dangerous beast. In the novel A Little Princess, the author Frances Hodgson Burnett wrote, She looked as if she had never had quite enough to eat. Her very eyes were hungry. As you can see, metaphors help make language more colorful and easier to understand by bringing new color and life into common objects and ideas. I hope that this video has helped you understand more about metaphors. I've told you to clean your room a million times. When I was your age, I had to walk 15 miles to school barefoot in the snow. Ever heard statements like that before? These are examples of an overstatement, or hyperbole, which is one of the things we'll be looking at in this video. We'll also be looking at the opposite of a hyperbole, an understatement, and how writers use these figures of speech to enhance their work. So, as you can tell from those two examples, a hyperbole is defined as obvious and intentional exaggeration. It's an extravagant statement or figure of speech that is not intended to be taken literally. We use hyperbole, or at least hear it, quite often in day-to-day -day conversation. For example, you might say to a friend, I haven't seen you in an eternity. You saw this friend just last week, but to get the point across that it has felt like a long time, you exaggerate by using a word that implies it's been forever. Since this is an exaggeration and is not meant to be taken literally, it is a hyperbole. It is crucial to keep in mind that there are certain elements that make a hyperbole's function differ depending on context. In this case, the word eternity was used to create emphasis, but in a different situation, it could be used ironically. If you just recently saw your friend and coincidentally encountered him 20 minutes later, then making the same hyperbolic statement would have an ironic effect. Whether for emphasis or irony, hyperbole is never literal and is always an intentional and obvious exaggeration. Hyperbole is not just something that we use in conversation. Authors have used it as a literary tool for centuries. Take Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream, for example. The character Aegis is in opposition to the relationship between his daughter and Demetrius, saying, With cunning hast thou filched my daughter's heart. Obviously, Demetrius did not literally steal the blood-pumping organ from Aegeus's daughter. Saying that he has stolen her heart is an exaggerated way to imply that Aegeus is displeased with the situation. Here's a more recent example from Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five. When the Americans and their guards did come out, the sky was black with smoke. The sun was an angry little pinhead. Dresden was like the moon now, nothing but minerals. Here, Vonnegut describes the aftermath of the bombing of Dresden during World War II. The hyperbolic sentence, Dresden was like the moon now, nothing but minerals, works to emphasize the destruction of the city after its bombing. This arguably has a much more powerful effect than simply saying, Dresden was badly damaged. The hyperbole here may overstate the extent to which Dresden was damaged, but it drives the point home that the damage was extensive, perhaps difficult to put into language beyond the use of hyperbole for a reader who did not experience the bombing of the city as Vonnegut did in real life. So now that we've looked at hyperbole, let's flip things around and look at understatements. Instead of exaggerating, an understatement works by diminishing or minimizing the facts or situation at hand. Without context, these statements appear to be normal. Let's look at some examples. I could have done a little better on the test. Without context, you might assume that this person did reasonably well on the test, perhaps scoring an 80 out of 100. 
However, if this person only made a 20 out of 100, his remark would be an understatement. He obviously could have done a lot better on the test. Other examples would be saying, it rained a bit more than usual after a storm that lasted an entire week, or saying, we've had better games after losing 70 to zero. Understatement then is often humorous and usually ironic. However, it can also be used sincerely in everyday speech for speakers to minimize or downplay the situation. Take the last example. The football player could be commenting on how terribly the game went in a humorous way, or he could be minimizing the importance of the loss in an attempt to distract from the terrible score so he could move on. Understatement is also used quite often in literature. Here's an example from Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. What, art thou hurt? I, I, a scratch, a scratch, Mary, tis enough. Where is my page? Go, villain, fetch a surgeon. In this scene, Mercutio has been mortally wounded. Understatement appears when he reduces his wound to a mere scratch. Understatement in this case can serve a few purposes. For one, it tells us something about Mercutio as a character. His willingness to call his severe wound a scratch suggests that he is courageous and stoic. Secondly, for readers or viewers of the play, this initial assessment of the wound may lead to the belief that it is not so severe. Thus, realizing later on that the wound is mortal may come as a more dramatic and powerful shock. Let's move into the 20th century with F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby. I've got a nice place here, he said, his eyes flashing about restlessly. Turning me around by one arm, he moved a broad, flat hand along the front vista, including in its sweep a sunken Italian garden, a half acre of deep, pungent roses, and a snub-nosed motorboat that bumped the tide offshore. Here, the extravagantly wealthy Tom Buchanan describes his place as merely nice. The latter description shows that the place is much more than nice, thus calling it such is an understatement. The understatement in this case could say a lot about Tom. He could be attempting to downplay the magnitude of his estate in order to avoid appearing like a braggart, or he may be so used to his wealthy lifestyle that he can only think of what most people would think of as extremely extravagant as nice. Okay. Now that we've looked at overstatements and understatement, here's a review question to test your knowledge. Which is an example of hyperbole? A, the man was very tall. B, I would have liked to do a little better. C, the universe could be considered quite large. D, the spider was the size of a Buick. The correct answer is D. Though the spider may be large, saying it is the size of a car is an exaggeration. Separating fact from opinion can be a difficult task. In this video, we will discuss the distinction between fact and opinion and offer some helpful tips for distinguishing between the two. A fact is a statement that can be proven to be true by the use of evidence. Factual statements are true in all cases and for all people. In other words, facts are universal. Some examples include dogs are mammals. Albany is the capital of New York. Mount Everest is the tallest mountain on Earth. Each of these statements is true. Furthermore, each statement is verifiable and not debatable, provided that definitions are agreed upon. Put simply, evidence exists that could potentially prove or disprove each claim. Opinions, unlike facts, are neither true nor false. An opinion can express a belief, attitude, value, judgment, or feeling. Some examples include, dogs are the best mammals in existence. Albany is the most interesting city in New York. World War II was a terrible war. Each of these statements expresses an opinion. Note that each is debatable. In other words, one can potentially agree or disagree with. Debate, a statement of opinion. Note that the final statement, World War II was a terrible war, strikes many of us as factual. However, this is a statement of opinion. Yes, most people would consider World War II terrible. However, there is always the possibility that somebody out there holds a different opinion, as strange as they may seem. It is very rare for a statement with a value word like terrible to be factual. Now that we know the differences between a fact and an opinion, it's important to know how to distinguish between them when reading literature. Let's look at some helpful strategies. Watch for opinion masked as fact. A lot of times, professional or technical language can seem factual. In particular, you'll want to watch out for predictions. Predictions are opinions since they cannot be verified in the present. This is even true if the prediction is being expressed by an expert with an informed opinion. A zoologist who predicts that a particular animal will go extinct in 50 years, for example, is stating an informed opinion. This opinion is based on evidence, research, and expertise, but because it cannot be presently confirmed, it is not a fact. 
Value or judgment words often signal an opinion. LeBron James is very tall is a statement most people would agree with. However, the word very makes this problematic. What exactly does it mean to be very tall? It is not defined. What one person considers very tall, another may consider average or even short. The word very is an example of a value or judgment word. Here's a list of value and judgment words. If you see one of these in a statement, then the view being expressed is likely an opinion. Look for words like should or ought to. These words usually suggest a course of action or give advice. Though this advice may be advisable, it is rarely factual. No matter how much we agree with a should statement, it is by its very nature opinion. For instance, one should avoid smoking cigarettes. May be sound advice with a lot of supporting evidence, but it is still an opinion. Smoking cigarettes can cause a variety of health ailments, on the other hand, can be verified and is therefore factual. In essence, facts can be verified by evidence and opinions are statements of belief, attitude, value, judgment, or feeling. Before we go, let's look at a quick review question. Which of the following statements is factual? A. Ohio is a beautiful state. B. You should never drive faster than the speed limit. C. George Washington was the first president of the United States. Or D. George Washington was a great public speaker. The answer is C. This is the only option that can be backed up by evidence. Thanks for watching and happy studying.